The title of today's workshop is VSH Workshop, Raw Sensitive Hygiene. And uh, the person who's been mostly involved with the Raw Sensitive Hygiene development is the lady I'm about to introduce, Michelle Taylor from Plant Food Research. So she can tell you about this. That's true, it's been a really long process in fact I had two children along the way, so yeah, it's this is my little baby as well. But what this is, is a, I'm going to talk about the breeding of these Varroa sensitive hygiene bees in New Zealand. And I'm going to talk about the process that we took to set up the program, why we set the program up, and then also the challenges that we have along the way as with every child, very good things and bad things. So I'm going to talk about those. And then what we need to do as an industry to ensure that we're not keeping our heads in the sand, but we're actually embracing this whole thing about resistance and where we go to from here. So before I can talk about the program itself, we need to go right back to the beginning. And in the start, we got a group of uh, National Beekeepers Association beekeepers together to, um, as we have a research uh, team. And we started to talk about what we were seeing overseas and what we would need to do to combat Varroa in New Zealand. And we put together a little bit of a program but it was mainly based around the resistance. It was resistance that was starting to occur in 2003 here. You can see this graph up here. And all the pink areas are areas where Varroa is found. And in 2003, the red areas is where resistance was starting to develop. So it started to move through uh, the world as, as Varroa did so quickly move through the world at the start. And so what we decided is that we needed to have things in place. We needed to start to plan for things to be in place for when resistance actually arrived. And we thought we had between sort of seven to 10 years, and as it turns out, it's been about 10 years. So we're fortunate in that sense, it's been the longer rather than the shorter seven years. And what we did is we developed a Varroa toolbox, basically. So what is our arsenal and our toolbox? What things can we use to combat Varroa in New Zealand? We have our synthetic products, which we've talked about. We've got our Akistans and our Bavarols and our Aiken Bars and that, and that bracket. We have our organic products, which are both our proprietary ones, as well as just our generic products. And so these are ones where we're squirting things on, on the floorboards or using them on plastic couches or putting strips in or, or whatever that might be in terms of an organic form. Uh, we've got thymol, formic acid, uh, oxalic acid, and those are the three, um, three main biggies there that we've got for organics. Biomiticides is an area that you may not have heard about but you may have heard about it in the form of uh, metarhizium. So that's a biological mitocide. So it's something that will grow uh, as a living organism that we use to control another organism. So that's where metarhizium is a fungus and that's what it does to control the varroa. We also had, uh, we started to look at things just over the last couple of years actually, uh, through the same research team, about inhibiting the chemical resistance of, of the Varroa, and so basically that's looking at what's going on in the Varroa, what's developing resistance within the Varroa, and how can we inhibit that. And the last one was the honeybee breeding program, and that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the presentation. It's about how we developed the honeybee breeding program. So the first issue we needed to decide was, well, which of these resistance programs are we going to choose? Because there's quite a lot out there. We can choose anything, um, and, and what we're looking for is, some, is a trait or a program that would be able to confer uh, varroa control by the honeybees. So we can look either at honeybee characteristic traits, so things like uh, lengthening the brood, the, uh, shortening the brood period, so the cat brood stage is less, so it means that the mites that are in the, in the colonies at the moment, they have a 12 day period where they can develop. So if we can reduce that length of time, then not as many of the offspring will develop, and so therefore we will uh, be able to control the varroa easier. Other correct characteristics include those of the varroa, so looking at ways to um, uh, pull out the varroa so that the honeybees can identify those, or the varroa actually die within the cells, and then also there's measurements of the mite populations. So we've got things like the mites per 100 bees or the mites within the brood colonies and things like that. So we needed to then decide, okay, of all these areas, which one was going to be the most heritable? And it turned out that it was actually the behaviour of the, the varroa was so we thought. And we called that, the, the program that we started to look at was called suppressed mite reproduction delayed. I'm not sure why they didn't say delayed, suppressed mite reproduction, but it's suppressed mite reproduction delayed, so SMRD. 
And that's the one that we started to focus on. And that is a particular trait of where the honeybees are not able to reproduce in the cells. And so what we're looking for is mites that are not reproducing in the cells compared to those mites that are reproducing. The mechanism behind it was not clear, but at this point in time, we thought it was something to do with the varroa. We thought it was that uh, something in the varroa in those first couple of stages when, they, when they're developing, that something is shut off. And so therefore they go on and they can't reproduce. What actually it turned out to be is, you know, after years, a few years of research, is actually we now call it varroa sensitive hygiene. And this picture is of some cat brood in there, and you'll go, so with varroa sensitive hygiene colonies, you'll go in there and you'll see lines of these pupae with, with dark coloured eyes, and they've been opened up. And what's actually happening is it's the bees that are detecting these reproducing varroa. And they're going in and they're opening up these cells, and they either just open them up and let the varroa run out, or they open them up and they actually pull out the varroa, the, the pupae and get rid of the varroa as well. And so what it does is it prevents the varroa from reproducing. So that's just a nice little picture. You'll see lines of these, these ones. Sometimes the bees will go back though and they'll actually shut those, um, those cells up. And so that pupae will actually emerge as an adult a few days later. Why couldn't we just import the uh, genes was one of the major factors. Well, this is us beekeeping in Hamilton in January. You know, <laughs> there's a few conditions around here that we actually need to make sure that we um, that we're that our bees can actually cope with. But the real reason actually was we didn't want to import Africanized bees and we didn't want to be importing any other viruses or diseases with our bees when we brought them in. So that's the reason why we had to start with our own program and as it turns out it's much better for um, the bees to be able to cope with the environment if we get bees from around New Zealand. So what the first thing, the first step that we needed to take was, was basically a survey of do we have varieties of hygiene in New Zealand? So right at the start, we decided we'll look around the country and see whether we've got it. So what we did is we got 65 queens from all around the country. So we got, um, obviously this was back in 2002, 2003, so we didn't have carniolans in the country then. So the, the uh, program was all based on Italian honeybees. So your lovely yellow ones, plus, some black bees from the, uh, the uh, west coast here in the South Island. Um, so we had some pretty dark strains in there. And we got these queens from all around the country and we asked the beekeepers to provide queens that had the, the most genetic variation that they believed that they had. So if a beekeeper was applying five queens, then he or she would choose five queens from, from different lines that they were thinking that they were running. And what we found is that we had between zero and 20% of VSH. So what that means is a 20% VSH colony has 20% of the mites that are not reproducing within the cells. So now we knew that within the country we had uh, lines of bees that actually contained this varosis of hygiene trait. And so the next step then was to go on and to um, go on and actually develop this trait within our populations. So if you look here on the left hand side, you've got a cell with a mite that's normally reproducing. So she's got her, her egg down the bottom there, up the top there's the male, and then on the left there's some, and, and then above her is some um, mites that are, uh, will make it to maturity, and a couple of them that won't. On the right hand side you have a VSH uh, cell, and what that is is a, a, a female mite with just one egg in there. And so they either have one egg, or no offspring at all. So that, that's what makes a, a non-reproducing -reprodu one. So basically what's happened is the, the bees have opened it up and the, the offspring have, the mites have come out or the mites have run into another cell and it doesn't have enough opportunity for it to actually reproduce properly within the cell. It slows that reproduction down. So with our VSH assessment, how do we conduct these VSH assessments? Well, they take forever under a microscope. What you do is you, you get a frame of, of brood and these pupae in there have to be at least uh, pink-eyed but can go up to a purple-eyed uh, um, pupae in there and you start to pick open all of these cells and with every cell you pick open the lid and you focus on that lid. Is there any um, offspring on there? Is there any defecation mark on there? No. Then you pull out the pupae, you look all around the pupae and then you look down into the bottom of the cell and you see whether there's any reproductive um, the varroa in that cell. So you do that with every single cell and you, what you're looking for is a single female mite with her offspring. If there's two or three female mites in there, you can't count that one. 
So it might take you four hours to go through 400 or 500 cells to find these 20, because you need at least 20 of these cells to be able to do that. So that's one assessment for one colony. So as we'll talk about a little bit later on in maintaining this trait within the population, there's a lot of assessment that needs to go on. And with that assessment, obviously, is time and money. So we have our 0 to 20% VSH, and that's how we assess it. The second step then was to increase it within the population. And because it's a trait, uh, we needed to back cross these queens within the population. So what we would do is take these queens from, from the one colony, and then we would mate her back with her brothers in that colony. And what we're doing is, because we're looking for a single trait, which is a, character, a, a particular characteristic of the honeybee, we're looking for that trait and so therefore we're, we're magnifying that trait within the population. So the more um, genetic, uh, I guess, or the more sperm that we have in there, the di more difficult it is, is to be able to find those genetic traits. So that the reason why we did single drone inseminations was to, to cut that time down because we have a lot of uh, programs that are running overseas that maybe take 20 or 30 years and for us it was a funding issue. We had two years and then three years funding and then another two years funding to be able to do this program. So we were looking only two years ahead, although we had the final vision, we were only able to work in two year blocks. So it did limit our funding a little bit for that, a limit our ability to, to work on the program. So we selected single drone inseminations. So basically what we do is we have our, our drone on the left hand side here and uh, we invert the drone and out pops the semen on the top and we, we take it off with a very small syringe, really, really small syringe, and then we place that back into the queen on the right hand side there. So it's a pretty quick process. Uh, she doesn't feel a thing, she's knocked out with CO2, but um, man, she might have a bit of a headache at the end. But she, um, <laughs> we do a few of those a day, and we can only do them in the afternoons because our queens, uh, our drones, are pretty lazy. They don't like hanging out, um, they don't like producing anything in the morning. They're only afternoon drones for boys. <laughs> Man. So yeah, so most of our um, artificial insemination will be conducted between one o'clock and, and basically 5, 30, 6 o'clock, and then it's time to go back to sleep again for them. So <laughs> pretty limited for them, but it's all good. So what we found in terms of increasing our varroa sensitive hygiene trait within the population, first year we found 20, and then we found right up to basically 85% to 100% is what we could we could detect um, in our population. So these populations, are, they have mites that are not able to, or 85% of the mites are not able to reproduce because the bees are pulling them out, which is pretty good. However, the challenges that come with this, it all looks really easy when you put it in a line like that, but um, it's, there's a reason it's taken seven years. And the first challenge was, we um, the program was working so well that we didn't have enough mites. So we then had to start to breed mites to put mites back in for assessments. So um, we became bee mite breeders as well as bee breeders because we had to start putting them back in. So we set up our colonies and um, we couldn't treat them. So what we would do is we would either do, um, we'd put in some fresh brood or we'd be taking out the brood with all the cat uh, cells and the varroa in there. And that's how we maintain their healthy bee colonies. Uh, we lost quite a few along the way as well because we, we missed our timing so then we'd end up breeding excess furrow and well that would have a huge impact on our on our colonies too so we, we lost quite a few just simply because of the management of those, the timing. We then thought okay well we can breed these bees and we've got VSH, uh, VSH percentage in our colonies and in our queens. What does it mean in the field? If I just gave somebody a VSH queen, what would that mean? How many months would they be able to go without treatment? So what we did is we took the program to Great McCree Island, such a beautiful place you can see there. It's just idyllic, it's beautiful. So we took them over there and we ran them over there just to see if we could leave them on the island and, and naturally mate on the island and do their own thing and then, you know, with the intention that perhaps we could just come and, you know, take some queens off and we'd be fine. What happened though is that we had 50 colonies over there and we took them over in December and we naturally mated them on the island with our colonies that had uh, uh, lots of amounts of drones in there that were from the VSH lines and we thought this would be great. But by May, 48 of them needed treatment because they were dying. So we were kind of back to the drawing board again. There was, you know, we had two hives that didn't need a treatment and 48 that did. So what does that mean? And we were kind of expecting it, but, but not. We were, because overseas, they had seen that too. They, where you produce 
maybe 10 virgin queens from one mother, a, a good mother with a high percentage of VSH, and two of them would be great, and then the other, uh, the other eight would be sort of maybe around the 20% mark again. So then we started to figure out, well, okay, well, on, this, on the island, does that mean that we've got other sources of bees on the island, or is it just our bees? So what we did is we took all of the, uh, these, all of those 48 or 50 colonies off the island, we took them home, we treated them with our Bavaro, and we then re-ran those populations at Ruakuri again to see, look at the build-up and see whether they were able to um, control the varroa themselves. We thought maybe we're just taking them over and it's too much varroa in them for the, for the populations to be able to swap over and cope with. So we did that and found that no, they all actually did die. And it was still those two were alive. And those two, the, the best one lasted over 23 months without a treatment uh, and, then, and then died. The best thing would have been to have treated it once a year and to keep it going. But we wanted to see how long we can extend it out for. And the other one lasted for 16 months without without any treatment. Uh, still looking looking healthy. So with the excess varroa on the island, was that because we had taken the varroa over, or was it because there was other bees over there? So the the other way to figure out whether we had taken whether there was other bees that were coming in and genetic um, sources other than our own bees that were taken over. We put out uh, quite a few virgin queens just to see if they would get mated, and none of them did. So that kind of r removed the idea that maybe there was another genetic source out there on the island uh, because none of them were mated. So that uh, meant that we then needed to come back to the drawing board again that it actually was to do with the genetics, that we hadn't uh, developed the VSH trait within the population well enough. So then we started to think, well, okay, uh, these assessments are taking four months, you know, where by the time you, you produce a queen, and then you put her into a, uh, and then you artificially inseminate her, and then you place her into a colony, you then need to let her replace all of the bees in the colony, or, or a large proportion of the bees in her colony, for them to be able to start by, uh, having that VSH trait, where they're identifying <coughs> the reproducing within the cells. So that's a four month trait. So can we find a faster way to be able to analyze this trait? So we started to look to see, we got some uh, money from Environment Canterbury actually, um, which are no longer I, I think, but thanks to them, we started to work on an idea where we could actually develop a, a genetic fingerprint. So just as you guys all have your own individual fingerprints, the bees have a genetic fingerprint but, but within their genes. And so if you just look on the, um, what we do is we, we clip off the end of the wing and a lot of, uh, uh, beekeepers that are doing um, queens that for overseas anyways will, will clip the wing or whatever. So then on the right hand side there are, are, the, are the gene ladders basically. So what we're looking for is any differences in these ladders and on the left hand side there you can see uh, the ladder, it's a, it's a bit grey, I apologise for the quality of the photo, but you can see that there is a, a gap there in this one here. This is a non-VSH one and this is a VSH one and it has a different trait here that they, this, this one doesn't have. So this is, this is a well and this is one queen and this is a second queen from a VSH queen and the non-VSH queen. So that we're just looking at two just to give you an idea. And what happens is uh, we have a special machine that spins it out and the genetic um, uh, genetics fall at different levels because they're, they're heavier. And so what you see is you find, you can find different genes along the way. Just a very quick overview on that one. So we started to work on that, uh, but then the funding ceased on that one again. So that's still sitting in the wings, but what we did do is we did develop a method to be able to clip off the wing and identify it from the wing. So that's all published now and that's, uh, we can do that quite easily. Uh, we just now have to identify the actual gene. And so that's something that Rainbow Honey, which we'll be they'll be talking later on, we'll be talking about developing a, a faster VSA <coughs> that. So we got up to year five, uh, sorry, year seven and now, and, and the question was never whether we could really develop a queen with VSH. The, the question was always going to be, can we get it out to industry and make it useful for industry? And so what we needed to do was to see if anybody was interested in maintaining the population. So we ran uh, some industry workshops for artificial insemination and we got over a uh, uh, Dr. Susan Covey from US, UC Davis, and she's amazing. So she took uh, two courses through. We had 16 beekeepers that came through and learned artificial insemination. And basically all of them, maybe about one, went away and said, no, it's just 
too much, but we'll we'll fiddle with it in our own time. But we're not but we're not prepared to be able to pick up the program. So we got to the end of that year, and there was still nothing, nobody interested in taking up the program. Uh, so we thought, okay, well the next the next step, which was to actually start to compare these with commercial bees. We thought, well, maybe if we can start to compare these with commercial bees, then we might have some interest raised from the, the commercial beekeepers. Because obviously we started this program with industry input. It was industry that, that provided, well, we bought bees off the industry. It was industry that provided money for all of the funding. And so um, we needed it to be industry at the end of the program to be able to pick it up and run with it. So what we did is we then, we got six commercial beekeepers from basically the, the northern region and that was more simply because sending queens through the mail was, was going to be a very difficult um, option and we would potentially lose them. So they needed to be sort of within the, sort of a close region. So we found a beekeeper in uh, the Waikato, one in Taranaki, a couple in Hawke's Bay and then Rotorua and um, the Kaimai sort of region. So we found six of these beekeepers and what we wanted them to do was run six varial sense of hygiene queens. So these are varial sense of hygiene queens that have been mated with varial sense of hygiene drones on Great Mercury Island. So they each got six of those. And then they each got six varial sense of hygiene queens that we'll call half VSH queens because they're VSH queens, but they're just mated with random drones in the, in the Hamilton region. So just, um, yeah, just random drones. And then they also set up five of their own colonies to compare. So they ran, they, each of these six beekeepers ran these 17 colonies uh, for the entire season. So unfortunately, um, we sent these queens to them pretty late in the season, so not all of them survived. So it's pretty difficult in some points to actually compare survivability of these queens, um, but that's all right, we, there's other things that we can compare. So what, the first question obviously that you guys have is, is there any difference in honey production? Is there any difference in these queens that are uh, VSH queens, are they going to produce less honey? And obviously, honey is your main income. So if, you, if these queens don't produce honey, there's no point in you having them because they're irrelevant. Now, remembering that we were initially just looking at a trait, which is an individual characteristic. We weren't looking at a bee, just an individual trait. So now we're starting to analyse the actual bee that the trait is contained within. Because the, the idea being that we would we were going to be able to provide a trait, not a bee, and the trait would then go into your own populations that you'd be able to use and maintain. So we're looking at the, the basically the carrier of this trait now. So with our, with our carrier of our trait, to read this graph up here, each of these boxes is an individual bee, a uh, beekeeper. So box A is beekeeper A, beekeeper B, C, D, E, and F. And the next thing that you need to notice down here is VSH. So this, these colonies here, each circle is a colony, and they are VSH colonies, VSH queens. These ones here are half VSH queens, so the ones made with random drones. And then these are the beekeeper colonies. And what you can see here is there's no variation in these colonies for beekeeper A, B, too much C, E, F, E, and D. They're all basically the same. There's no significant difference in honey collection, which which for you guys is brilliant because that's why you want to make sure that your, your bees are still going to be out of collecting honey. The next point that we looked at was temperament. So are these bees that are going to work with them? These are going to be really nasty bees. You know, I've picked up some of these black South Island bees. Are these going to be all right to use? Or are they going to be okay? Because most of the, most of the population is actually all pretty yellow because it's Italian. So what we did is we got them to assess temperament. Now how we assess temperament is on the, the left hand side there you can see the numbers one to five. One being the worst, really aggressive, really stingy, uh, and five being really calm and gentle and no stings. So every beekeeper, and obviously they, they uh, it's pretty subjective because of the, the beekeeper themselves. So you can look within each, within each box here and again, there's not really any significant difference in temperament of these bees between the BSH queens and the beekeeper queens. There are a couple of little outliers here uh, and here, but it's a beekeeper one and this is a half BSH and beekeeper one. You're always going to find some variation. So the, uh, in terms of significance, there's no significant difference in temperament. So that's another good tick for the, the carrier of the trait. In terms of February brood health, well, what does brood health look like um, at the end? So these are colonies that have uh, not had a treatment 
in spring. So our VSH and our half VSH queens had no spring treatment, but our beekeeper colonies had a spring treatment. So we would expect our beekeeper colonies to have brilliant brood in February because they've had a spring treatment. But what we're seeing here again is, is ver oh, variation within our beekeepers here to the same extent that you'd see for the VSH or the half VSH queens. Keeping in mind though that we have removed some of the colonies that didn't survive because these queens, again, the variation that I talked about earlier on with the, the VSH percentage being different between sister queens, we still find that and we're still developing that. So that's an area that the industry is now going to have to, to work on as, a, as an industry together to figure out how to reduce that variation and effectiveness uh, when you're passing on the trait between each, each um, to each sister, uh, daughter. But we're seeing variation. So the brood health of those colonies that were VSH queens and half VSH queens was actually pretty good for those ones that had not had a treatment. Now this is in early February. And so that's what you need to keep in mind. Uh, Mark talked about early treatments earlier on. We did a trial on all our, or our, all our organic products a few years ago and the beekeepers that treated in the first week in February, their colonies survived. For those that uh, treated in uh, two weeks later, all of them died. So really when we're talking early treatment, we are talking early treatment. You can't just leave it for a week. You are, it does need to be done by that, at least that first week in February. So we've got a, uh, a, a bee now that's got good honey production, the temperament's okay, its brood health is looking pretty okay for those colonies that, that do actually control the varroa properly. And the brood health, uh, the brood should actually look like this. It should look like a normal colony, a normal frame. However, there are spots here. <coughs> and so often you look, you pull that up and you go, huh, spots, mm, it's chief A and B. But what's actually occurring is up on the, up on the top right hand side there, that's where the, the, the beans have opened up the cells and they've either pulled them out, which in this case is what's happened here because they're not sealed, they've pulled them out totally, or you'll see them open like that and then they'll, they'll recover them back up at a later point. So that's what's going on there. The, the brew frame should never look sick. There should never be any sunken cappings or, or, or greasy looking cappings. It, sh it should look healthy. The brood should be healthy. So then the next point we wanted to look at is, well, what are the varroa levels like of these colonies that have not been treated in spring versus the colonies that have been treated in spring that were the beekeeper ones? And again, I'd expect for those beekeeper colonies to have pretty low levels of varroa. But, oh, but notice up on here, we've got 100 mites per 300 bees in beekeeper C. Uh, and these ones up here are 50, and these ones here are a little bit higher. And this one here is the only one, the beekeeper here, beekeeper D, is the only one here that control that was able to have total control of the the mites within their beekeeper colonies. All the rest were really varied. So it either suggests to us that it's just getting too late in the season, the varroa is, is is increasing rapidly or it's suggesting that we're starting to see a lot more resistance in the area and so the, the treatments aren't working as well as we're used to them working. So now what that does is it puts this, these queens in this almost in the same almost in the same field as our ones that have been treated previously in spring. So the intention of this trait was never to have a single bullet. The intention of the trait was to put it into a toolbox as I've already discussed. So when you're thinking about these VSHBs, the idea is not to think of it as a single thing, it's, it's to be able to increase the health of your colony and it will work together with the other products that we have. So it should never be a case of just putting these bees in and then, and then leaving them and, and, and expecting them to control the role because they can't. At the state that they're in now, they can't do that. But what they can do is they can make the um, the products that we do have work better and work in conjunction with them. So these are our parole levels. Uh, they're in February, that they're, they're up to 150 in some cases, um, which obviously is too high. But then in other cases, we're finding that we've got, uh, straight down here, we've got lower mites, which is only 300 bees, and these colonies haven't been treated. So that's that's pretty, pretty exciting news in terms of um, where we're going with the program. This little graph here is an interesting one. It's a little bit harder to read, but just focus on the left-hand side one for a minute. This is the VSH queens. 
what we've got is a VSH percentage along the way. So what we did is we assessed the VSH percentage of all of these queens in uh, November. So um, Warren and I went to uh, these beekeepers and we took out the frames of colonies that we needed to assess and we drove back to, to Hamilton and assessed these frames. And VSH assessment, as I said earlier, was the percentage of mites that are not reproducing or appear not to be reproducing because they've been removed, the reproducing ones have been removed. So we were able to have that assessment in, uh, in November, December, or November. And what we then did is we graphed it against the mite levels that were there in February to see whether a higher percentage of, of VSH trait meant that there was lower levels of Varroa in, in the you know, February is when we should be retreating again. So what we see here is is a really um, the slope here. The slopes are the same. We've made them the same. But what is what it indicates between the difference between the VSH queens and the half VSH queens? Because some of you will be buying, you know, will be buying queens that have a VSH assessment already done on them, and some of you will buy a breeder and then produce a bunch of queens from them. So they'll be like your half VSH queens here. So that was the reason for assessing half VSH ones. What we find is that both of them, the more, the higher the, the VSH percentage, the less mites you have per 300 bees. So what that slope tells you is that for every increase in 10% VSH you have, you have uh, 6 percent six mites less per 300 bees. So you increase up by 10, so you have 6 less mites. Increase up by 20, you'll have 12 less mites. Up by 30, you'll have um, what am I up to? 12, 18. So you have 18 less mites per 300 bees, which is, is, is quite significant. Between the VSH colonies and the half VSH colonies, the line you can see on the half VSH one is higher. And what that means is, is that at the 10% level, the VSH queens have 27 less mites per 300 bees than what the other ones do, which again is also quite significant. Uh, the standard error there is pretty high, it's, it's 9 but it's still indicative of the fact that is an increase, the percentage increases that you do have a decrease in the amount of varroa per 300 bees. So, we turn next for the program because it's time to hand it over, it's time for industry to take up this uh, varroa sensitive hygiene trait. What we need to do is commercialise this trait so that it can get into your own bees and so the genetic diversity that we have is not lost. Okay? So we collected these, these queens back in 2003 and four, uh, four for the second round. And so these were before the Carniolan bees came in. Collected them from all around the country and ran these particular lines over the years. So our genetic diversity that we had was Y to start with. But obviously as, we, as we've been selecting, we will have been losing a few of these, um, a few of these genes. We haven't seen any effect on brood health yet. It's not been noticeable. We've kept a very close eye on that because obviously that's one of the major things with the breeding program, the closed breeding, breeding program to make sure your genetic diversity is really wide. We haven't seen that. And we don't probably expect to see that for a little while. Um, it could have helped because we accidentally outbred them by mistake a couple of years ago, just accidentally on a couple of the lines. Um, doors were left open and things like that. So we got a little bit of an influx of genes at that point. But on the whole, it's the main Italian bees, they still have those genetic lines uh, that we initially collected. And it's an interesting point because with the uh, Carniolans coming in, we now have two distinct populations. We have a Carniolan population and an Italian population. And the importance of this is dramatic because we need to ensure, because we're a small country, we don't, we don't import bees into our country. We have a limited gene pool. So with our limited gene pool, we now are starting to collect our queens from, from our queen producers, yeah? These queen producers get their queens from one or two breeders. So the genes are all the same. So what we need to do is start to be putting in a, into, into plan a bit of a way as to how to keep our genetic diversity really wide. And uh, that's up to you guys as an industry to start working on that issue. So we need to increase our genetic diversity. We also need industry support to be able to have this program run. Obviously, I've explained it takes a lot of time and energy to assess these bees. And so where the program now needs to, is going to Rainbow Honey, and Rainbow Honey have got these bees, and so in spring they'll be producing queens. 
They're going to be producing queens with BSH percentage. They need to assess those percentages and keep those, increase those percentages over time through assessment and then maintaining them and then increasing them over time. So that's a, a program just in itself. We need to develop a genetic VSH assessment, which they may talk about a little bit later on. That's the wing tip one, where we're clipping the wing off and we're assessing the genes within that one. And also developing VSH consistency. That's a pretty big one. So basically that means that if I produce, um, if I produce 50 queens, 50 virgins, from 50 sisters from the same queen, what is your VSH percentage within that population? And how can I figure out how to reduce, uh, to, to basically, <coughs> And be assured that the VSH percentage is going to be high rather than low or not at all in some cases. So it's developing a VSH consistency within that. So there's the program in a nutshell. So I want to leave enough time for you guys to ask questions because obviously there'll be lots of questions out there. But I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of those of you that have either put in money or have um, put in time and energy and actually or even run some of the programs. You've been fantastic. It's been really good. Thank you very much. Have you ever compared the, the gene sequencing with the original host of Varroa, which is the Asian honeybee? No, we haven't. Oh, the honeybee, you mean? Yeah, the, the original host of Varroa, which is Asian right. Serena? Yeah. yeah, no, we haven't. Okay. There might be some you know, other thing there that you could see. Like maybe there's another bit in the whole gene the code that yeah. might help with um, because they have they can deal with that right um, yeah our, our issue in, in that is when you bring in genes from overseas you end up with viruses or Africanized bees or <coughs> other particular diseases right. so we are limited with that one because we don't we don't have an input health standard to do that yeah so importing bees is a no-go at this point in time yeah is this trait that tends to spread out or it's it, um... a good question, yep. So this trait is a, an additive trait, so basically that means that it's not just there or it's not there, it means that you can develop it within a population over time. So basically you are, um, you can increase that in, in over time, but without selection pressure, so in other words without Varroa, it will drop out of the population because it's not needed. But it's, it's not recessive as such? No, it's additive. It is additive. Additive, yeah. Yes. What about uh, producing a BH queen using carnelian strain? Yeah, we looked at that when Candy Olins came in, um, but it was deemed that because we started the Italian one and we we're already a couple of years in, that we weren't going to be able to pick up that Candy Olin one. But I guess that's where better bees will come in because they have Candy Olin bees. Mm. Yeah. So they run their own individual bees there. Any questions? Uh, another one over here. Yeah. Um, have you, well with, um, what are your views on uh, gene therapy where you could flick a marker in there as opposed to using breeding, you could, you could be a um, you know, genetic engineer, have someone do that, so it's just flicking the switch and breed from those? Yeah, we're, we're actually, um, we have a particular inhibitor that we're looking at doing it with the actual varroa, so we inhibit the development of chemical resistance within the variety and it's a very similar thing but when we start talking about RNAi um, there's a big patent on that one so no go that research will shut down. Um, after bringing in the VSH queens into an operation yeah. how from the, like where do you go from there is that just a case of bringing it in your own operation or do you have to keep bringing in? I think you'd have to keep bringing it in but the idea being is that um, Rainbow honey, that they'll obviously explain how that will, will occur. But the intention being is that in this first couple of years, it's just getting the genes out into the populations, and then as you start to produce, uh, you're starting to produce drones with these particular genes. Then your natural mating, the idea being is that you'll have drones in the environment. So your VSH queens that you bring in can then, uh, you know, cells they can they can mate with these drones that you've got out there, so they'll have levels of VSH trait in them. And then, so it's 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 going to be both. So you're probably not going to have time as a beekeeper. You're not going to have time, or probably want to have time, to assess VSH in your own colonies because it's really time-consuming. 
but you might want to find somebody that is that will come in and that they will do that assessment for you or can come and collect a frame from you. Um, don't, don't look at me, we're not into that at all, so I'm not, that's not a plug for me because we don't do that. But there, there is probably, um, I think Rainbow Honey is going to look and start doing that sort of thing. So there's ways to be assessing it without you run it in your own beehives, but then somebody else can do the, the assessments for you. Question about the consistency. So, if you um, if you read a hundred sisters from one point, yeah, um, the five BSH, what, what from your work is the consistency of percentages from this in the orbit? The higher the BSH percentage trait within a queen, the more of the sisters she will produce that have BSH at a higher level. So, if if it's only twenty percent, then you're not going to get very many of the daughters that will produce. BSA, have the BSH trait will produce a high level. But if you have 60% or 65%, then the majority of them will all sit around 30, 30 35% if they're just naturally mated. Yeah. So you get more as the higher the percentage goes up. 80%? What's that? 80%? 80% um, 80, 80 is, is uh, that's, we, we managed to get those, and you can probably sustain those at a good amount of without too much difficulty. Trying to maintain a 100% population is is not worth your time, which is what we've experienced. It's a lot of effort to get 100%, but you might have a queen that throws 100% one, and then that's all good. That's actually an interesting point. I meant to point it out on this, uh, this graph here. These points here, on the 100% one there, those ones there, we, um, I was nervous about uh, keep even bothering to keep those results because what I was finding is when we were doing the analysis, we couldn't find any more than maybe five mites in the in the in the frame. Um, you know, we go through 500 of these cells, and there was only five mites in there. But each of those mites, the five mites, they all had no reproduction. So I was thinking, oh, it's not enough. I need 20. I wasn't going to keep the data, but then obviously, as a scientist, you always keep data. Um, so. At the end, when we put it all together, what we're finding is that the parole levels of these ones that had um, these low levels of mites in the colonies at the start actually did control the varroa over those three months. If I'd done this, this uh, varroa level assessment at the same time, I couldn't have been able to use that data because it's, it doesn't mean anything. But because I've had three months between when I did the first assessment and the second assessment, I've had the population should have been growing. So it, it, it's indicative of the fact that it's actually starting to control the varroa. So even though I couldn't find a lot of mites in there, it's probably going back to year three when we actually had to start breeding mites to put them in for assessments. It's a similar thing going on here with those mites there. We couldn't um, find enough in the colonies to actually do a full assessment on, but the the results from that show that they're controlling the varroa at a good enough level. Interesting point. Just a quick one about the captain over of the group. Yeah. And you can actually see that on the frame, it looks different to... Um, yeah, now, I wasn't sure if any of you had picked it up, but there's a little... See that little hole there? It's not AFB. <laughs> that little hole there is, um, is actually where they are, the bees are starting to notice a, col a cell that has uh, mites reproducing in it. So what they've done is they've started to open it up there. And so sometimes they'll just leave it like that and it will just come, the mites will just come out and then they'll seal it up again. If they get to this point, oh, if they get to this point up here, they'll, they'll either start to cover it back up again or they'll just leave it and they'll just mature like that, sealed, uh, unsealed like that. They'll just, just mature like that. So yeah, so it's, it'll initially be like this, just a little cell here. And then they'll work down a line. But they 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 can't always because what happens is they go back to the same feeding site, so they need the mother to keep that feeding site open because that's on the integument of the bee, and so without her they can't they can't um, they won't stay alive. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
we don't know. This is a mechanism we don't know, but we, it's probably to do with some sort of pheromone or something or other like that. Well, it could, it could be movement or it could be pheromone. We don't know because it's sealed over by wax, so you assume that not too much is going to get through in terms of pheromone from those those cells. No. Yeah, very cute, they are. <laughs> We've still got a long way to catch up with them, I think. <laughs> Uh, sorry, last one from me. Um, it, it's wax and pollen, so air can get through, so they can breathe. So maybe the pheromone can get through. But just, just as a, another point, I noticed the USDA are doing a breeding program where they are combining traits of um, heavy grooming and biting the mite and pulling the mite's legs off with the VHS. Do you think there's a um, possibility in New Zealand that that'll ever be done here as well, with the get the two traits, the two markers, and try and meld them together in the same... Um, you guys could do that, yeah. That's, it's just because the one trait it was so expensive to start along the way, it, we're limited by funding here to do that, but it's definitely something that you could do. That was, you know, when I was talking about those heritable <coughs> traits at the start, the, the ones that are stopping VSH from... Uh, stopping the, um, the, the... It's the bees that are actually able to protect the Baroa. So these heritable traits that these bees or these mites have, that's one of those ones where you, you get damage to the bees going on, uh, sorry, to the mites going on. And so you'll often find these crunched mites in the bottom of the, of the on your sticky boards or on your floor boards here. You're not gonna see them obviously with a, um, uh, with a mesh floor board, but you will see it with some of the other ones here. But with all of the thousands of sticky boards that I've counted, um, I haven't seen any. So it's not a high, um, there's not a high rate of it here in the colonies that we've done assessments on anyways. Yeah. Peter? Oh, just to ask about, if the, the uncapping behaviour has resulted in mother mine leaving the cell before she's successfully reproduced. Yeah. I mean, they do of course re-enter a cell, don't they, a number of times before mother mine They can do, yeah. yeah. But then it will set you back, yeah. basically, for 50 days. 50 hours, sorry. So then the reproductive rate is reduced for any particular mind that gets interrupted. That's correct, yeah. So even if those ones that are in the colony, in, in the cell, that the, the offspring that are being produced, even if they do survive, um, there's only going to be maybe one or two that will survive because the rest haven't been laid in that cell. They'll have to wait until the, the uh, varroa has gone back into another cell, it's been sealed over, she's um, emerged from the brood food in the bottom there. She's laid another male again, first male in there again, and then she lays her female ones again. So it's quite a long period of time that she's been stopped for. Yeah. Yeah. So what does this mean for the number of students <coughs> uh, I've had to receive? Good question. Um, five years ago I would have said, oh, right, you'll only need to do one treatment a year, or one every 18 months. Uh, but with the effectiveness of our treatments just decreasing now, it may mean that you you only it means that we don't have to go and start treating four or five times a year like they're doing in the states. You can only treat twice a year as status quo now. So it really is dependent on the ability of the other products that we have, and the aim of this VSH trait is to support those other products as well to set it up into an integrated pest management program and run it like that. So you're using your organics, you're using your synthetics, you're using by my size if we can ever make that work, um, and you're using your VSH trait to be able to support each other in a program, uh, rather than in just treatment, continual treatments like they're doing in the States in some places. How successful is this uh, with breeding overseas? Um, what they did is they've done it overseas, and uh, probably I'll get Ray to sort of talk about that a bit more in the panel discussion perhaps, or even in her who won, but there's some programs that have been run over there that, that are very successful, but what happened was they released them too early. And the industry didn't get in behind, and so what happened is there was a lot of negative impact from that, and so they decided, well, we're not even gonna carry on with it. So they have only got a small population of people that are using the trait there, who seem to think it works really well. But what you need to understand is that this is, the program's not finished now, the program's just stopped at the point where um, 
uh, science is maintaining it, what we need to do now is that industry maintains it with the help of science. So it's that we're, we've moved on to that next phase now. So it's now industry that needs to pick this up and start um, providing feedback on the queens that they're getting, starting to uh, do the VSH assessments and things like that, and actually developing it with their own things, and then starting to look at it as a bee. Okay, now now we've got this VSH trait, but what are we going to do with our bees, and how do we want our bees to look, and how do we want them to perform? It's starting to produce the actual package now, rather than just the trait, whilst also developing the trait. Thank you very much. We'll love to see you at the end of the session. Thank you.